Max Ophüls is one of the most influential filmmakers in the history of cinema and simultaneously almost completely unknown to modern audiences. Many great filmmakers praised and have drawn extensive influence from him, yet few spectators today have laid their eyes on any of his works, despite having created some of the most significant films of the 1950s. To refute any accusations of overstatement, and to exemplify just how relevant his work really is, one shall say that it is fair to assert that filmmakers such as Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma, Robert Altman, or Paul Thomas Anderson, to cite a few famous ones, are defined in one way or another by the work of this German-born and naturalized French director, since Wolfius was shooting stunningly breathtaking long takes 40 years before Goodfellas or Magnolia saw the light of day. Working in the same golden decades representative of some of cinema's most exceptional achievements, Ophius is a prime example of a select group of cinema's finest avant-garde filmmakers, someone who pushed the envelope and thrusted the art of film to heights unseen until then. His love for carefully constructed and dynamic long takes places him side by side with masters of the same era with similar propensities such as Dreyer, Mizoguchi, Renoir, Wells or Kalatozov, and therefore reflects the root or fountain from which other grand artists like Tarkovsky, Antonioni, Angelopoulos or Jancho likely came to drink as inspiration for the shaping of their visual identity. For more on long takes, and specifically sequence shots, to refer to an earlier video on this channel that presents an overview of the technique through the lens of a scene in Theo Angelopoulos, the suspended step of the stork. Despite being known for his restless camera and compelling motion from both narrative and visual standpoint, this video however focuses on another essential aspect of cinematography, namely framing, which is found particularly highlighted in Ophius' masterpiece Le Plaisir, or The Pleasure in English, a film containing three unrelated stories, but all based in the passions stirred by sensual desire, adapted from original works of Guy de Maupassant. Truth be told, Le Plaisir obviously contains some of the most exhilarating long takes in the history of cinema, like the pursuit of an odd character that enters a frantic ballroom and dances until exhaustion, or the one gravitating near a brothel while following the establishment's madame across several floors and rooms from the outside, or even the POV shot of the suicidal mistress in the third story, a scene reminiscent of the dazzling modernist sequence in The Cranes Are Flying. Yet when one concentrates on other less conspicuous elements in the canvas, a sophisticated lesson in character framing becomes evidenced and demands particular attention. This singular characteristic, perhaps for some just a curious trait of a bygone era or a simple stylistic trick, the one would classify it as an extremely gratifying one nonetheless, has all but vanished in the modern filmmaking approach, one which relies on conventional structuring of visual pieces through the employment of the typical shot reverse shots, close-ups, and shallow focus, while rarely resorting consistently to variations like two shots and wider, more encompassing shots, as well as deep focus. The latter assortment of techniques indeed allows for a highly creative exploration of the sets in terms of prop selection and arrangement, as well as spatial disposition and related character blocking, which is ultimately reflected extensively through the set design and its mise-en-scene, in conjunction with the cinematography, not only providing the spectator with a much profound apprehension of the world in which the drama unfolds, but also taking the viewer from the amorphous, indifferent role of invisible witness, differentiating the intention behind the act of viewing, for now one is taken to be an outsider peeking at private matters, or a member of the group observing the events from amidst its individuals, therefore bringing an aspect of authenticity and participation to the film that would perhaps be absent in ordinary, perfunctory framing. In Le Plaisir, the viewer will oftentimes be placed in a fashion that allows the action to unravel within the physical framework of the scenario, with both its natural and artificial constructions, as the environment is displayed organically entwined with the characters, cementing the atmosphere of the film as a fully coalesced representation. The spectator therefore stands often in a position which considers and attempts to evoke his physical presence in the world in which the film develops, leading him to behold the characters enclosed by the windows and Venetian blinds of an apartment or by the road and trees proliferating the countryside, or by the furniture, paintings and homely elements that decorate an habitation, or by the people gathered in merry excitement in a friendly meeting. Perhaps the most iconic of these instances is a deceptively simple shot which showcases two of the greatest French actors of the era, Jean Gabin and Daniel Darieux, woven together in an atmosphere of unspoken romantism, but of clear joy nevertheless, 
amidst the sprouting leaves of grass in a pastoral setting. In Le Plaisir, the locations are not simply a vague, indistinct, passive representation of the film's backdrop as in most movies, but instead a clear, thought-out scenery passable of being taken advantage of for the purpose of constructing a simultaneously dynamic and engaging world. This cinematographic approach highlights Sofiu's masterful command of framing and blocking at the service of aesthetic refinement and viewership participation in his work, a lesson whose value remains unchanged for contemporary creations, further singling out the director as a particular example of an equally talented craftsman and inventive artist. In an age where most movies are distinguished by how spectacular their multi-million dollar visual effects are perceived and how successful they are at transforming reality from a green screen, one can be sure to find a replenishing and still surprising degree of ingenuity amid informal settings in much smaller productions of limited means, in which apparently tiny details carry great significance and much is achieved with little, without strident rattle nor jumbled visual motley. Make sure to check off his filmography if the directors named earlier are part of your preferences, and if you wish to explore some truly outstanding examples of creative and groundbreaking cinematography that are rarely commented, or even mentioned in contemporary film dialogue. La Ronde, Le Plaisir, The Earrings of Madame de, and Lola Montez are all superb examples of cinematographic brilliance and are all available through Criterion's film catalogue. Stay tuned for more insights into cinema's unfairly forgotten masterpieces and other film-related content from all over the world. Thank you for listening and see you next time.